Bruce, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure. Uh, I'm Bruce Russell, and I'm a philosophy professor at Wayne State University in Detroit. I've been there for many, many years. Uh, I work in uh, ethics, epistemology, and philosophy of religion. Those are my specialties. Uh, I'm actually here at my place in California where I grew up but I um, went to UC Davis where I got a bachelor's degree in math and a, ultimately a PhD in philosophy. Cool, and so the topic today was the problem of evil. Can you tell me more about your position on that? Sure, so I have a very simple argument. I arrive at it by considering some other versions of the problem of evil, statement of the problem of evil. I won't go into those right now, but we can get to them if you want. But the simple version I have goes like this. I assume that when we're talking about God, we're talking about an all-knowing, all-powerful, holy good being. And uh, the argument goes like this, that if such a God exists, there wouldn't be excessive, unnecessary suffering, by which I mean way more suffering that God need allow in order to bring about certain goods or to prevent certain evils or bads. So that's the first premise. If God exists, there's excessive, unnecessary suffering. And the second premise simply says there is. Look around at how much suffering there is of innocent people, innocent children, and the like. And it seems like it's way more than God need allow if he exists in order to bring about uh, important goods or prevent important evils or bads. And so from those two premises, it follows by an argument for him called modus tollens that God doesn't exist. Well, and uh, is that, are you going for more of an evidential one or a logical problem of evil with that one? I'm doing it evidentially because I think that the evidential problem uh, is called that because of the second premise in my argument, it's there is excessive unnecessary suffering. So I don't think that's a logically necessary truth. I just think that the best explanation for all the suffering we see is that there's way more than God would need to allow. So it's not a logical truth. The first one I do think the claim that uh, if God exists, there wouldn't be excessive unnecessary suffering. I think that's necessarily true but not the second premise. I think uh, I justify accepting it because I think it's the best explanation of all the suffering we see in the world. And how do you think most uh, apologists would respond to that? Um, in the past, they've tried to, some of them are skeptical theists. That's a very important line. And the skeptical theists try to argue that we're in no position to judge that uh, there's excessive unnecessary suffering and they sometimes uh, compare uh, a novice at chess and he looks at what um, move of the masters and says, oh, that's a blunder. But then people say, well, wait a minute, he's a novice. He's in no position to judge that the, that the master is making a blunder. So that's a standard line of defense by what are called skeptical theists. And do you think that's an unsuccessful defense? I do think it's unsuccessful. Um, I uh, respond to that argument by an analogy, and I introduce, uh, well, there are such people, but young earthers, by which I mean a broader sense than most young earthers are taken, but somebody who thinks that the earth or the universe was created recently, maybe 6,000 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, maybe... Bertrand Russell suggested this maybe five minutes ago. Uh, and they say, well, uh, we're skeptical theists of a sort ourselves, but we think that it's reasonable to believe that the earth was created recently. Why? Well, God being good is against suffering, and there'd be a lot less suffering in the universe if, you know, people were just created recently with all of the kinds of scientific knowledge we now have. And whatever, maybe it's not so much, but whatever 
we've gained through interactions with each other on how to live with each other. And so they say there's a kind of sketch of the reason why, you know, God would actually create the universe recently with, uh, in order to avoid all the kind of suffering over thousands of years that animals and humans would experience on the standard account of how we got here. We got here, but we evolved. Uh, is kind of the standard account, even by theists, many theists, except evolution. But uh, the skeptical theists say, well, there's a more direct and more humane route. God should have just made us with a bunch of this scientific knowledge and so certain kind of social knowledge. And so that's why he created the world recently, but made it made it look like it was much older uh, because he didn't want to make it uh, apparent or obvious that he was the creator uh, because that would somehow take away from human significant freedom. And so I say, well, that's their argument. And the problem is that nobody really thinks that that's a good defense, that they say we're in no position to judge theory is wrong. But I think everybody thinks, well, there's something absurd about that defense, that scientific evidence just makes it absurd to think that uh, the young Earther's view is correct. But it has the very same logic and form that the skeptical theists offer. And so I said, mine, uh, a reply to the skeptical theist, the standard ones, not the young earthers, is an argument of arguments. If the um, if the defense of the young earthers is bad, so is your defense, skeptical theist, about being in no position to judge that there's excessive, unnecessary suffering. So that leads to the the argument that that response could justify any position, any any position you could possibly want to hold because you're just simply saying that since we're not in a position to judge, God could have done anything regardless of whether or not we understood it. And so anything could possibly be justified. Uh, well, I think it's a weaker position, Tom, the skeptical theists say. They don't say that it could be justified. They just are giving a defense against somebody like me who's offering the argument and just saying we're in no position to judge whatever the second premise is in my case that there's excessive unnecessary suffering, they don't say that they're justified in thinking there's not. So there's a subtle difference between what people call a theodicy that tries to actually give a kind of defense of why, uh, and a reason why God would, you know, allow so much suffering. They just kind of, uh, the skeptical theists try to turn the tables on the defender of the argument from evil, say, well, we're not saying we're justified in believing why God allows all this suffering, but we just say you, uh, uh, atheists, are not justified in your argument, in particular in the second premise. But I, essentially, um, there, there are things called undercutting and overriding defeaters, and what the skeptical theists are saying is that you're in no position to judge, and that's kind of an undercutting defeater and I give this example in my um, one of my papers, maybe a couple of them, that if you're in the country like I am actually right now, that uh, suppose it's dusk and almost dark, and there's some uh, canine-looking animal 200 yards away, and and you say, oh, that's a coyote. There are coyotes here, and uh, and I say to you, well, wait a minute, it's so dark, you can't tell a coyote from a from a, the neighbor's German Shepherd. So you're in no position to judge. I'm not saying I'm justified in believing it's not a coyote, but you're not justified in believing it is because the the uh, lighting conditions and the distance between you and the animal is too great. So that's kind of the structure of the skeptical theist uh, attempted defeater. And it's the same kind of uh, undercutting defeater that the young earthers employ. And so I'm saying basically, uh, that if that kind of defeater doesn't work for the for the young earthers, it doesn't work for you, theist either. I wonder if they say something like it's it's good. Suffering is good because it's required for free will or whatever, like the theodicy, or that um, yeah. God wants us to suffer because it's uh, soul building something or another. Yeah, there's this famous phrase about. Uh, Here's the play, John Hick, a famous uh, philosopher of religion, used this phrase, um, earth is a place for soul building or soul making. Um, and 
the reply I have is that, well, you know, it's a good thing to have freedom. Uh, and maybe it's important if there are souls to make your soul. <laughs> but there's a limit, you know. Sometimes uh, if you the freedom is so great that it allows people to, I don't know, rape and torture little kids and the like, that's beyond the pale. That it doesn't seem reasonable that a good God would would allow that in order for you to have freedom, which is needed for what? Why is it so significant that you couldn't curtail freedom uh, given those hor horrendous, horrible consequences? Certainly that's what we think. We think, okay, we, we want people to have freedom, freedom of speech and, and action and association and the like, but we say, wait a minute, when you start raping people and torturing them and stuff, that you, you don't, uh, freedom isn't that good to justify allowing those kinds of horrible actions. It's good, but not that good, basically. So I, I typically so I, like to go with the argument that even if freedom was required, um, it's logically possible to create a world with all of the positives and at least one less negative. So like, if I can show that there's one logically possible world where rape wasn't possible, but all of the, the good things, the free will, uh, soul building, whatever else, can still be done to the same degree without rape. Uh, that would disprove God, logically. Without, logically without, without rape, did you say that? Is that the word yep. you used? Yep. Um, well, my answer is the skeptical theists are going to come back at you. They're going to say, you're in no position to judge. You're like the novice chess player. Uh, trying to judge the moves of the master. So I think really skeptical theism is a contender that uh, atheists have to deal with. And I try to in the way that I describe. But otherwise, I think that's the retreat position for them to occupy. Well, I think that you can defeat that group of people specifically by... Uh, Presenting a logically possible world, um, which with is, which is better, which is, has all of the good things and one less bad thing, because then, um, then you've proven you are not the novice chess player. It's like if if I can show there's a checkmate uh, in in one move, which is there's there is no logically possible way for it to be better a better move than that um, in a chessboard. Then you've you've won the argument. You can't you can't get better than that. And so. If I can show that there's at least one better way the world could be with all the good things and one less bad thing, then I've shown that um, the argument that I'm a novice can't be applied anymore because I've shown logically that there's one better possible world that God didn't pick. I think the skeptical theists are not going to allow you that premise. That is, they're going to say, you don't know that all of these, the suffering and rape and so forth, the one case even, you don't know, you think it's it's logically possible, but for all we know, all of it, every, every last bit is necessary to bring about some greater good that we don't grasp. You might say you think you know, sometimes people think they know that something, or they think they know that something is logically possible, but they find out after the mathematicians prove otherwise that they were mistaken. So you're like a novice mathematician to, and you're trying to make, uh, you know, the, uh, the Nobel laureate in mathematics, you, you're claiming that it's logically possible, but they're saying for all, for all, you know, it is not. But wouldn't they hold the burden of proof at that point to show that my argument has a logical contradiction. They can't just say it might that we haven't discovered yet. Cause that seems like if I say one plus one equals two, you could say the exact same thing. Oh, well maybe you're just a novice. Maybe there's some logical contradiction there that just we don't see yet. Clearly that would be irrational. Just like in the example you gave of saying that uh, we don't think the world was a young earth three, 6,000 years ago because of all the science. Um, so simply saying that, well, maybe, God did that, or maybe God knows a way to around that. It doesn't seem sufficient to justify belief that there's a logical contradiction with one plus one equals two. And so why would it, in the case of a more general argument that a world without rape could have all of the positives and none of the negatives? Because the answer the skeptical theist will give is because 
the one plus one is two is some uh, obvious uh, logically necessary truth, and so one plus one is three is a contradiction. That's those things are within our ken. We have enough uh, knowledge of simple mathematics like that to know that the one plus one is two is a necessary truth, and it's three is logically contradictory. But we're not in that situation when it comes. And it's between us and a, uh, a Nobel laureate mathematician, and we're trying to decide on the basis of what appears to us about some complex mathematical proof that there's, uh, it's not contradictory, but they're going to say, uh, to continue the analogy, that you're a novice mathematician and you're no position to judge, but you are in a position to judge one plus one is two and one plus one is three is contradictory. But it's not analogous because there's a, in the actual, the simple addition cases, there's no um, Nobel laureate mathematician that we're comparing, that we're taking our appearances uh, to be definitive where we can do it in the case, simple cases. We can't do it when, when there, somebody's saying, but they're, Maybe some, we think there's a mathematician, a, a super mathematician, and your uh, appearance of no contradiction isn't adequate evidence to show that there really is not uh, a contradiction. Well, in the case of like logical contradictions, it seems like you can, because if you can write out any argument, any logical argument, you can tell whether or not it has a logical contradiction in it, right? Like it's P and not P at the same time. And so if I describe a world simply by you imagining can't. it, I, I can't. <laughs> you can't. That I bet you can't. My, my answer is, uh, nor can I. And the answer is that uh, when they proved a few years ago Fermat's last theorem, there actually were flaws in that argument that, that uh, the mathematician didn't see and other mathematicians ultimately did. But certainly no novice would have caught those flaws. Well, that would seem like I it would be. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. It's fine. So I'm saying like if I can give, imagine a world with uh, a square, for example, a square Lego or whatever, then it's logically possible, equally as much so as one plus one equals two. Simply the fact that I can imagine it proves it's logically possible. I can't imagine a square with a round, a round square. I can't imagine a world with a round square. That's logically yeah. impossible. And so any yeah. any world that I can imagine um, would necessarily not entail any logical contradictions simply by virtue mm -hmm. of the fact that I can imagine it. Um, and so if I can imagine a world without rape and imagine it also having soul building, that proves it's not logically contradictory, it seems like. I think you're begging the question again that you can imagine it. The answer that the skeptical theists always say is in order to be justified in believing that uh, it's possible, you must think something like this, that all of the goods and evils, the intrinsic goods and evils you're aware of are representative samples of all the goods and evils that there are. And they're going to say, you're, you're not justified in believing that. How, how do you know that there aren't other goods and evils that uh, God is aware of if he exists that you aren't because you're just a finite mind compared to his. And so you can't satisfy that condition that uh, you, you're aware of or you're aware of a representative sample of all the goods and evils, uh, intrinsic goods and evils that there are. And if you're not aware of those, then you, you can't be sure that uh, what seems logically possible is because you may be leaving out consideration of those other goods and evils beyond your ken. And so you're, you're in no position to judge. You're just judging on the basis of the evils and goods you're aware of or a sample of them. And in addition, you don't know what's necessary for what. You don't know what's logically necessary for those other possible goods and evils of which you're not aware. So you're really not able to. You're, you're missing a whole bunch of data, so to speak, namely the possibility of goods and evils beyond your ken. So I think I can identify all of those without actually needing to know what they are. So, for example, whatever all the goods may be, they have to be in this world, right? Because all the goods, if, if this is the best world God created, all of the goods, whatever they are, must be in this world, right? Something along those lines. No, I don't, grant, I don't think you should grant. 
I don't think that Thea should grant that, not at all. They should say that for all you know, they're, for all we know is what they do say, there are other goods and, and evils and especially goods that are only achievable allowed by allowing significant freedom. And, uh, you know, they, they're not in this world, they're in some other world. That's why they have to posit, actually, I say this about Swinburne's arguments, he has to actually posit uh, some world because he thinks that if there were an all good God, that he wouldn't allow a life to be all, all in all, on balance, bad for the person. But some lives are just looking at them in the, you know, in our world, bad for the person. So he thinks that's a good reason to think that if God exists, there must be an afterlife where things can be, you know, compensated, sort of, it went bad in this world, but, you know, all in all, counting the afterlife in this world, your life is good on the whole. Because he just accepts that God wouldn't allow somebody to have a life which is bad on the whole, and he realizes that some people in this world do, and so it, you know, forces him to say there must be an afterlife where things can be, you know, made better. Not in this right, world. You have to have access to that good via this world, right? So that so that good, the afterlife, achieving the afterlife, uh, is achievable via something in this world, right? So so that good is still a part of this world in, indirectly. I don't think so. Then we're not aware of the specifics of the good. We just know that argument I gave you from Swinburne just says, well, since there are you know lives that are bad on the whole in this life, and there wouldn't if God exists, there wouldn't be. Uh, lives are bad on the whole period so there must be some sort of goods in the afterlife that compensate but that that as soon as you allow that there are goods in the afterlife that could compensate um then this uh, claim that you're known to judge that uh, all the suffering in even one case that it isn't required in order to achieve those afterlife goods you can be aware that there are, Tom, I think, afterlife goods. Maybe you accept Swinburne's argument, but you don't know what they are and how they are related to the suffering in this world. The theist, the skeptical theist says, for all we know, the suffering is necessary to achieve those specific uh, afterlife goods, even though we don't know the specifics of them. We just know that there are some. So, so my argument is, is more general than I'm saying that whatever the goods are, they have to be entailed by or connected to the world as it is right now, the way it is right now, right? They have to be, all of them. There can't be a single one that's missing yeah. by the theist definition. I think so. So if I take the class of all things as they are now and mm -hmm. say, before we're placed in this world, we're given the option, would you like to go to this world or go to a different one? I've now given you the option to take all of the oh. goods you get all of them. You just choose this world. Now I don't have to know anything about them. I don't need to know what they are, how to get them, nothing, because they are all entailed in this one set. And so I give everyone the option: you can go to this world and get all the goods, or you can opt out and say, "No, I would. I'd rather not be in a world of rape." That seems to be a moral improvement. It seems like morally, if you're given the option to get all the goods but are not forced to, um, that would be a better world. And, and so now I, I've, I've 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 taken all of the goods. Up. What? Can't be done. Answer is every single thing in this world, every bit of suffering in this world is either itself necessary in order to achieve some uh, goods in the afterlife, or even if the suffering itself is not necessary, the freedom which produced it is necessary to have its good in itself, as well as certain afterlife goods of which we don't know the specifics of. That was a bad sentence, but I think it communicates. <laughs> you don't know. There, there's, there's some goods that happen that uh, James Herbert you know, talks about, uh, focuses his essay on, you know, horrendous suffering that is caused by immoral actions. Um, yes, and the skeptical theist should say, for all we know, that doesn't mean we know the opposite, but for all we know, that having that freedom, which is good in itself, plus what it makes possible in terms of the afterlife good, all of that allowing that free freedom and its relationship to this afterlife good is logically necessary to have both the good of that freedom 
and whatever those afterlife goods are of which we don't know the details. So it's, it's, it is related. I give you this, Tom, that it is related, but I'm, I'm just denying that, you know, eliminating, let's say, suppose we stop that person from raping the little girl that, that uh, we don't know, say the skeptical theist, that, uh, that uh, it wouldn't be better all in all lot, and logically required to allow that in order to achieve uh, some goods of which we're unaware. Well, so, so my argument is that uh, let's grant that, just say that's true. And let's say without changing anything of this world at all, every individual, before entering this world has the option to enter it or to opt out and be like, nah, I'm not going to go to that world at all. I'm going to take none of the goods from it, none of the bads, I'm going to take none of it and go to a different world of my own choosing, separately, completely separate universe kind of thing. Yeah. Now, you've had the option to pick all of the goods, whatever they may be. I don't need to know anything about them because they are. I know they're necessarily entailed in whatever this world is like as it is right now. And so if you have the option to go to this world, you have the option of giving all the goods. And you can opt out and say, I don't want the goods. So I'm, I'm dropping the goods. Don't care. Um, and that seems to be a morally better world where you have the option to choose to enter this world as it is and accept all of the goods with all of the soul building requirements or whatever. Or you can opt out and be like, nah, I don't want to be, I don't want to play that game. You, you played a bad game. I'm going to go play my own game. That seems to be a morally superior world that has all of the goods. You have every good ever God could ever want because it's entailed in this world and that's one of this world is one of the options and you just opt out. It's like, nah, I want that. And that seems like a morally better world. I don't get it. I don't know why. I don't know why you know that. I mean, I get what you think, you know, <laughs> but I think it's like the, the novice chess player saying, you know, look, I, I have this choice of making all, all of these, uh, what I take to be good moves and none of the bad ones, and I can choose, and blah, blah, blah. And, and But the trouble is that you're going to give up something. You're going to make some bad moves you don't realize. That's what they're going to say if you choosing an ignorance about how these things are related. Well, then, you know, you might make mistakes in, in choosing, you know, no, I'm not going to choose, choose this world. Well, if really all these great goods are dependent on the details of this world, you shouldn't choose not to go to this world. But that part doesn't matter. You're, because it doesn't, you're it doesn't matter. Now choosing. So well, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if we make mistakes because we have freedom. We're allowed to make mistakes. And so it may be a mistake not to choose this world, but that's not what's important. What's important is, is it moral? Is it more moral to allow us to have the option to choose God's design world with all the benefits or to mm -hmm. opt out? And I'd say, yes, it is more moral to give us the option to force us into it without our consent. Therefore, if God could give us the option to enter his world with all the goods and the bads or to opt out and go to our own, which may or may not be a mistake, it doesn't make a difference, yeah. then that's a more moral world that has all of the goods that are in God's world, but one greater good because you have the option to choose it or opt out. And therefore, even if it's a mistake to opt out, it's a more moral world that has all of the goods, which is the only condition required to defeat the skeptical theist, which is, can you posit a world with more moral goods and all of the goods God has? And I can say, yes, yes, I can do that. Well, okay, so that's a different argument. I have to think about this some more, but my first thought is uh, it changes the subject because the subject is, was could a God, from the problem of evil, I mean, the, sub, the question is, could an all good, all knowing, all powerful God create a world like this. And so you're raising another option. Well, maybe he would have done this other scenario, had this other scenario. But it seems to me that, I don't know that he, it's just like we as parents might, you know, create children and, and, you know, treat them well and have some plan, you know, for their lives and so forth, that we couldn't be faulted even if we didn't somehow, where did we get these free choosers? They had to come from somewhere. And so on, on your scenario, they had to come from somewhere. But my thought is that as parents, we could create children and, you know, have a, a kind of life outline for them, including freedom, that we couldn't be faulted for doing that, even if it would be better somehow there were children that just came from nowhere 
chose their own life, it doesn't seem to me to speak to the issue about whether God is somehow, if he existed, he couldn't do this or somehow blameworthy or something for couldn't be an all good God if he created a world like this. That seems to be the central issue about the problem of evil. And it's not about whether it would, there is a better world that had free beings choosing their world. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this, Tom, but I, it, I think it changes the subject. And then it's a new subject. And then that subject gets difficult because then the question is, where did those free beings come from? Weren't they created by something or someone? And now we're off on a different tangent. But I think it misses the focus of the problem of evil. Is there something kind of blameworthy in a God, you know, creating a world like ours? Well, I think the goal um, with it is to say that if I can show there's one morally better world and God didn't create that world, then God can't be perfectly moral kind of a thing. And so if I give an example that has all of the goods and one more good or one less evil um, and God didn't create that world, then God can't be perfectly moral. He chose to do something that isn't the most moral possible outcome, disproving that God is either perfectly good or all powerful or whatever. And so my goal with that is to show I can create a model that has all of the goods, regardless of whether or not I know them. I don't need to know any of the goods yeah, because I know that they're entailed in this world in some way. And so if I have this world as a set, um, I have all of the goods. And now that I have that as a plain piece of my logical argument, I can defeat the skeptical theist because I can now address any argument they have because I have all of the goods, regardless of whether or not I know them. I have them all. In this, in this argument, and I can use that as a playing piece to then posit a better world. Can, can I choose, as for example, the one I like is give people the option to choose world A or world B with the goods, without the goods. And, and so the goal with this argument is simply to show that you can address the skeptical theists by having a way to entail all of the possible goods, even without knowing what they are. Yeah, I don't know. So, Tom, I think your argument uh, is in, along the same lines that you started with, but I think it, I haven't heard this argument before. So I think it's different from the first one you gave me. And I kept trying to defend the skeptical theist response in that one, because there was one where you're saying, I can imagine a world just like this, but, you know, say one less rape or something like that. And I said, hold on now, now, <laughs> you may not be able to imagine that. And then I brought in, I don't know. First, the, chess, the novice chess player, then kind of the novice mathematician versus, you know. And so so I thought those, those uh, the skeptical theist has a good answer to you saying, no, you're really assuming you can, that these things you imagine really are logically possible, and but your finite mind doesn't really justify you in believing that. So I think that's the right answer that the skeptical theist should give to those standard replies. Uh, I don't know. I think you're, I don't know, Tom, I mean, maybe it'll work out. I, I'm just skeptical that on the end that the, this, this choice from a person, I guess the idea is God creates various worlds and he says, would you like this one? Would you like that one? Or something like that. And then maybe he creates three beings and then, then it's like a smorgasbord and then they can pick, pick worlds off it. I guess that's your picture. I, I, I don't know what to say, Tom. I have to think about that more. I, you, you get my point. I'm just trying to do my best for the opponents, I think it's the right thing yep. to do to be charitable intellectually. And in the initial uh, responses you gave, I tried to give what I thought was the best skeptical theist response. Yeah, that was usually just my hierarchy tree of how my argument grew to come to that conclusion was I started with this classical replies. And then I yeah. agree, I think that the, the skeptical theist has a reasonable response to just removing rape or whatever as a particular example but i yeah. don't think they have a reasonable response to what that led my argument to become yeah. which is the version it is now and i've had many skeptical theists on mm -hmm. and i don't think they've yeah. given an adequate maybe response so. to that maybe so you know my argument is that I, I was just doing the analogy with the young earthers so that's my attempt to defeat them it's still up to me as i say in some of my papers and others who defend the problem of evil to Suppose you say, they, the skeptical theists say, you're in no position, Russell, to judge that there's excessive unnecessary suffering. Okay. And so I says, well, uh, I don't know. You better not say that because then the young earth is going to come on the scene and you're going to be re reduced to an absurdity. All, still, I have a burden of proof 
to explain why I'm justified in it, even if they're wrong in saying I'm not justified. I, that doesn't follow that I am justified. So I still have a, a burden of proof there. And, and, you know, ultimately I fall back on inference of the best explanation. There is this fact of all this suffering in the world. What's the best explanation? There really is a, a excessive unnecessary suffering or no, no, no. There's a God who has a hidden plan, which we can't grasp and all that. I think that second hypothesis is not the best explanation contrary to what Swinburne thinks. And so inference of the best explanation comes in for me importantly to defend the second premise in my argument. Gotcha. I understand that. Um, what do you, I've heard that inference of the best explanation is uh, affirming the consequent. Have you heard that before? Uh, it, it, it does say that, but it's not. <laughs> The point is that, you know, well, let's see if we can think of a case. Uh, I don't know. Let's, let's think maybe about planetary motion. I don't know. It, here's all the, if the, if the sun goes around the earth, then we'd observe all these things through telescopes about, you know, planets and all that stuff. We do observe all these things about planets and so forth. And therefore the sun goes uh, uh, around the earth or let's do the other the earth goes around the sun let's update <laughs> if the uh, earth goes around the sun then we'd observe all these things we do observe all these things through telescopes and like therefore the earth goes around the sun affirming the consequent no it doesn't work that way it just says look there's all this data and what's the best explanation of the data i often use the example a simple one of you see footprints on the beach in the water's edge, you know, uh, and they're, they look like human footprints, but there's no human around. Well, what's the best explanation for these footprints? Well, one is that some guy has a trained monkey, bought some rubber feet, took the monkey out to the beach and had him walk along the beach. That's one explanation. The other explanation is somebody recent, some person recently walked on the, walked on the beach and there are two competitors and well we think the best explanation is somebody recently walked there and so it's not affirming the consequent it it's not trying to say because you observe this data therefore the hypothesis is true it just says when they're competing hypothesis the one that measures up to whatever the standard of best explanation is that's a really tough question that's that's the best explanation and it's epistemically relevant that is it gives you reason to believe that hypothesis over the competitors. Gotcha. What do you, what do you say about the uh, intelligent design argument that you can see design in certain things like a BMW or whatever, and you can infer design from it? Um, how would you respond to that argument typically? Yeah, well, you know, I thought the design argument was a lot better before Darwin came along. You know, the, the standard ones, people looked at the eye and saw the complex structures in the eye and said, well, what the heck, uh, either best explanation or something like that. Uh, it must be some designer that made the eye. But then, wait a minute, uh, Darwin says, wait a minute, we, we don't need a, at least immediately, we don't need a designer. Um, you know, there's this evolutionary theory. It, it acts kind of like a blind watchmaker, but it's not a watchmaker. It's just, uh, you know, whatever... Uh, physical laws go to produce ultimately humans and eyes and the like. Okay, so then it works back. Uh, the worry then, the focus when I think Darwin comes along, the focus is no longer like the eye or things in the universe that have structure because a lot of those can be explained analogously to how Darwin explained the structure in the eye. But now what about the fundamental laws? This is what Swinburne looks on. The focus now gets broader. It's not on things in the universe. They, they're grant that those things can be explained scientifically. But what about the structure of the universe? Well, um, there are several things to say about that. So Swinburne tries to say the best explanation for the regularities uh, that are described by the laws of nature is that there was some creator who made 
the whole universe, not things in the universe, but the universe itself orderly. And my answer says is before you get to the problem of evil, first I want to know is this is the creator also good besides being all powerful? Oh, and then you get the problem of evil, and well, then it doesn't seem that's so odd. Okay, so now suppose we just put aside the problem of evil and say, well, what about the structure of the universe? So just to be clear, initially I think that there are things in the universe that, dis that display marks of design. Ultimately, they get a scientific explanation. So then you have to move up if you're going to defend some design argument or something like it. You have to move up to the structure of the universe. I'm just re reviewing what I said a moment ago. Okay. So uh, then I think, well, hmm, let's look at the details of this. It's an immaterial being. And we don't really know why it created this universe rather than some other. And so there's still some things left unexplained because maybe, you know, this creator could have created another one. So why do we have this universe rather than some other? It doesn't answer that question. Uh, the problem, I think, is that if you say it's an intelligent being, there are two problems. One is that, uh, as far as we know, intelligence is dependent on some physical structures like the brain and not the other way around. It's not that we're intelligent because we have some immaterial soul, but it's because the brain actually is the source of our intelligence. Do we have empirical evidence? Yes. That people have brain damage or they have Alzheimer's or something like that, how come their kind of mental capacities diminish if you affect what goes on in brains? So it su suggests that intelligence is actually founded on some physical structure rather than the other way around. Secondly, there's a famous mind-body problem about how can immaterial beings interact with matter? Descartes said, oh, I've got the answer. It's at the pineal gram. No. That wasn't the question. It wasn't where, it was how. How in the heck could that happen? That there's something that's not in space and time, and yet it interacts with things that are in space and time. Well, God may be in time, and that's a controversial issue, but it's not in God. Immaterial beings are not in space. Now, how in the heck could that happen? So it, it introduces the creator hypothesis, introduces a mystery in order to try to solve a problem. That is, it tries to solve the problem, why does the universe have the structure it has by introducing an Im immaterial being who's the cause of it? But that's introducing mystery to explain something. That really doesn't explain. Just to finish up, the often there's this famous example, people say, why does uh, opium cause sleep? Answer simple. It has dormitive powers. Wait a minute, that wasn't a very good explanation. And it's even worse when it comes to an immaterial being because we think, okay, dormitive powers, we'll look further into it. We'll see that it's really uh, morphine and morphine has this chemical structure and it interacts with neurons. And Okay, it promises a detailed explanation, but the immaterial soul or immaterial being explanations always have this problem. They're kind of introduced mysteries unsolvable ones. It's kind of mysterious. What is this dormitive power stuff? But it's not like forever mysterious. It promises uh, a way to be solved or details can be filled in. But that's not true with an immaterial being causing uh, things to happen. So my putting the problem of evil aside, my problem with an immaterial being creating the universe is that it seems to give an explanation. But when you dig down, it really introduces mystery to explain. So my steel man of the intelligent design argument is that like if we suppose we saw an alien spaceship that was landed on the beach, it was clearly technologically way beyond anything humans could make. We didn't see any aliens though. No, no aliens, just the spaceship. It's got some joysticks, seat, buttons and stuff. Um, it seems like we could rationally infer it was designed. There's some property in this, this structure that is um, we can use to infer design. And if there is such a property, 
then that property could be in other things like DNA or the laws of physics, potentially. And if it was, we could then infer those things were designed. And so what the argument that I think the intelligent designers are typically making is that we do see there's this property of design in things like a BMW that we could then yeah. potentially identify in a spaceship. And that same property could then be identified in DNA. Um, and so how would you respond to that kind of an argument? Well, I think it just marches back, like I was kind of suggesting. So what explains the structure in DNA? Well, there's something, something else that explains that. And so ultimately, I think it, that what explains things are the laws of nature and the initial conditions in the universe. Given these initial conditions and the laws of nature, you're going to get these results. Of course, you, there's a whole bunch of uh, very complicated things that went on. So we can't sort of with our finite minds know every one of the steps. Uh, and there's also, physicists think that at least at the subatomic level, randomness. So you have to factor in laws of nature, initial conditions in the universe and randomness. And all, those three things are ultimately going to explain, I think, whatever structure you find in the universe, starting with the I going to, I don't know, evolutionary theory or starting or getting to DNA and explaining why DNA has the structure it has, all of it ultimately is going to be in terms of some physical, you know, facts and randomness in the universe. And that's why, Tom, I switched because I was going quickly and giving, you know, I, giving what I thought it was a scientific explanation for most of these phenomena that uh, have kind of the marks of design in them and saying, well, ultimately then, people like Swinburne are going to challenge you to explain why do we have these laws of nature? And then I was giving the explanation about what, where ultimately I think that one appeals to mystery kind of uh, surreptitiously. <laughs> I think the laws of physics one and the biological one are two separate cases I would address separately. Like the laws of physics one, I would say, well, if it's going to be determined by a God of some kind, they can be determined by a necessary law of quantum mechanics or quantum field of some kind. And that could explain the laws or the laws could be um, a result of a con of a further law we have yet to discover, which causes them all to be intertangled in such a way that if you change one, they will all proportionally change due to something like the fine structure constant. And so they'll all necessarily have the same proportional range to one another. And that would fully explain the fine tuning just fine. Um, and then if you want to say, well, why does it have that particular structure? I can just say the same thing about God. And so it leads to an infrared argument. Um, but I, I find the biological one interesting because I think they have a point when they say that there is something that we can see that we can use to identify design. When you look at a BMW or we look at an alien ship, um, there's clearly some difference between that and just a rock. Like we, we probably would not infer that this was a result of a natural process. And mm -hmm. if there is such a category out there of a justifiable inference that this is design, um, it's potentially justifiable to say DNA was like that. Now, obviously, I agree with you. I think DNA is a result of evolution, abiogenesis. Those are the more plausible explanations because of the evidence we have that indicates those through novel predictions and, and the work in biology. But I think that they, the intelligent design movement does have a point that there, there may be this property of uh, design, whatever it may be, that we can identify in things. And that's the part that I think is the most interesting strongest part of their argument and I would, i'd like to hear more of your thoughts on that is there this property of design that we can see in objects like bmws or spaceships and if so how would you address that part I, I, let me ask you a, a question first tom i'll respond but um you were distinguishing the dna to the physics cases why what, what was the reason for you i was trying to lump them together but well, I think that it just kind of like laws of nature that either are biological or physical, and so they account for the apparent design. Well, I think in the case of physics, um, instead of simply saying that you're positing a mystery to to solve a greater mystery or something, we can just posit a better explanation. Like it's just a quantum quantum law, a quantum field, something kind of like that, mm -hmm. and that would that would explain the the consistency of the laws of physics just fine. Like, What's the problem with saying it's determined by another law that we haven't discovered yet? Problem solved. And so there's no need for a God to explain the fine tuning of the physics whatsoever. And there's always, there's going to be 
two options. It's either determined by something, a God or another law, or it's going to be random. Um, and so if they're going to assert God is the determining factor for the laws of physics, we just assert a different determining factor, problem solved. Um, whereas the DNA, I think the DNA argument is more compelling because it does very much seem like a language, like a code. And the codes that we see are um, typically made by minds. And so it's it's much more relatable to people. It's much more compelling to people than the laws of physics, which most people don't understand. And so I think that the way to address them um, in a way that is relatable to most people is very different. Whereas if you address them in the same way, it has a different effect on people than um, taking more time to really um, think about the biological side than the physics side. Physics side is easy, just posit a different alternative determining factor. I think I get it. So I don't know. People think about the double helix. Isn't that really, you know, design like itself that requires explanation? And I was trying to say yes, and it has a, has a I don't know, a physical explanation too. But but let me try to address the question you, you asked. I was just trying to get clear about you, you're making that distinction. Um, so do I think that there are sort of signs or marks of design? Isn't that basically your question? How do I address those? Yeah, like so if okay. we see a spaceship, there seems to be a design something we can identify there. Yeah. But then you think there's also those things that have the appearance of design in the natural world? Is is that what you're going to grant or do you want me to address that? I'm not sure what you mean, the appearance of design? Well, I mean, like you, you look at, uh, well, people... <laughs> Back before Darwin, people looked at the eye and said, "Whoa, that oh, yeah. look—it's kind of like, you know." <laughs> or even the, I always say to my students, "Well, look at the body; it's got all of these parts, you know, the these vital organs that fit together and they keep the person alive, and legs that let them walk from here to there, and the brain that lets us think, and blah blah blah, and it all fits together pretty nicely." Geez, <laughs> that's as complex as the eye—the whole human body. So anyway, those seem like. There are lots of uh, what I call marks of design, by which I mean that they have relevant similarities to things we know were designed, like a watch designed by a human, and maybe not one, maybe many watchmakers or computers or BMW or any of that kind of stuff, you know. So they have similarities. The things in nature are similar in certain respects to, to uh, things we know were the product of intelligent designers. And my, my answer is, and there are a lot of things in nature where the proximate, the sort of near cause is not, clearly not uh, an intelligent designer. Just think about snowflakes. They have a lot of complex structure in them, but they're obviously caused by atmospheric conditions which are not in themselves intelligent. And so, it's like, uh, I often use this example of uh, a Van Gogh painting and one by Van Gogh, and there's this other painter who's a forger I call Van Foe, and Van Foe paints a lot of uh, paintings. And now you look at this painting that I say is in the Van Gogh style, and you say to him, okay, what's the, what's the likelihood it's a Van Gogh? Well, Yes, if there's only Van Gogh around, you know, painting in that style, it's pretty likely that it's a Van Gogh. But what what if you also have lots of examples of Van Foes around, you know, and have the same kind of similarity to genuine Van Goghs? It makes a lot of difference whether it's rational now for you to believe, oh, this new painting, because it has that style as a Van Gogh. So I just say the same thing when it comes to proximate causes, at least. If we have a lot of examples of things that are created by approximately by unintelligent uh, forces, when we see some other thing in nature or wherever, wait a minute, we, we have to worry about all those Van Foes. Those are, you know, the ones that are caused by, I don't know, atmospheric conditions and the like. And the, yes, we do have examples of watches and computers and so forth, but wait a minute, that, those are just Van Goghs. And so my thing is, it, it, my idea is that, yes, there is the appearance of design uh, because uh, these things in nature have features and structures similar to things we know were created by intelligent beings, but it uh, weakens the argument considerably when you also realize there are a lot of things in nature we're sure 
that the proximate causes, the nearby causes, were unintelligent forces. Those are van foes. And we didn't have, a, maybe we had a, not so many van foes around way back when, but now we have lots of them. And it seems like we're discovering more and more all the time. And yes, we do know that there are some things, BMWs, spaceships, watches, and so forth, that we're, we reasonably believe they're created by intelligent designers. But that doesn't settle the issue when you have a lot of van foes around. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the question I think is the most interesting one. Like if we discovered a spaceship on Mars or something that we know we didn't make, it can't be human. Um, what is it about those kinds of objects that we could use to infer that they were in fact designed as opposed to a product of natural processes we just don't understand yet? And where is the, the transition point? Like if we saw certain kinds of crystals, like a gigantic crystal, I imagine we'd probably say that was just a product of natural processes. But if we yeah. saw something with literal joysticks and seats, we'd say that's probably not a product of natural processes. Yeah. And so what is the property we're looking for and how do we identify it in those kinds of things to tell the difference between whether it was a, whether we can infer design or infer it was yeah. a unknown natural process. So it varies along a spectrum, according to me, that there are some cases that are clearly so similar in their details that we're justified in believing intelligent design. There are other things that are more like things we know in nature now were not caused by intelligent design and those we should think not designed. And then there is a gray area between those two ends. It's like heaps, you know, the concept heap is vague. Clearly this big amount of beans is a heap of beans. Three beans is not a heap. And then there's a, this area, gray area in the middle where I think there's no fact of the matter whether it's a heap or not. At least uh, I don't think we're justified in believing it's a heap or not a heap in that gray area. So that's my answer is this specific similarity, joysticks and all these other things uh, made out of certain material that we've never seen in nature like that, you know, shaped and put together aluminum or something like that. You know, we don't see aluminum. We see a rocks from which we can take aluminum, but we don't see aluminum in nature. And so it's these specific similarities to things we know were the product of design uh, that makes us justified in believing the spaceship was designed. And if they're pretty much like things that we know were created by natural forces here on Earth, then we're justified in believing they were not created by design. And then there's a gray area in the middle and you have to, that's just the facts. There's a gray area in the middle, just like with heaps. Gotcha. And what's your position on morality? Um, objective morality, is there such a thing? Can God ground objective morality? Yeah, so my answer is there definitely is. <laughs> I tell my students, look, morality is just like math. <laughs> you have to learn it. I mean, that you already know it, you know, but there's some objective moral facts. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> The famous example of philosophers love is torturing kids for the fun of it is wrong or genocide is wrong or there are all kinds of examples that I think they're objectively true. Of course, it goes back to the famous Euthyphro dilemma when it comes to bringing in God about it. So I don't think that uh, having an objective morality requires the existence of God. In fact, I think the Euthyphro dilemma, which basically says that, uh, well, are things good because God uh, commands them or right, uh, or are they good independently? And I think if you say they're good because God commands them or right because God commands them, then it leaves open that he could command torturing kids for the fun of it. And that would be right. That seems absurd. So it seems like God, there's some independent standard of good. And of course, God doesn't violate it any more than he thinks can make two plus two equal five. Would um, something being right because God commanded it, would that make morality inherently subjective because it's contingent on opinions and intuitions and so it wouldn't even count as a basis of objective morality at that point? I think it, well, let's see. The first response I think the defenders should say of a divine command theory is that um, a good God couldn't command those things. And so is a solution supposedly to God couldn't make torturing kids for fun right because he's good. 
and a good God is logically incompatible for him to command those things. I think it just pushes back the issue. Then what makes God good and therefore unable to command, you know, torturing kids for fun. Um, and I, I think then the youth of role dilemma just reappears. Is he good because he approves things? And then, then that would still, that would open up subjectivism again, because he could seem like he could approve anything. And you know, then he says, oh, I approve this and I, I meet that standard, so I'm good. And then, then, I don't know, off he goes on to commanding things to make him right. So I think ultimately, Tom, my answer is that it does make morality subjective uh, finally, even if it kind of can avoid the problem with the Euthyphro dilemma when it comes to obligations. It has to fall back on God's goodness, and then I think it succumbs. So what about if it was grounded in his nature and has nothing to do with his opinion? His opinion is just a, a post hoc. So it's like his nature says, yeah. this is good, and then because of his nature, um, he will then have the opinion that this is good, but his opinion will have no effect on the goodness one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Would that make it potentially objective? My answer is I don't understand actually that response, the nature. The the, the only way I think that the his nature prevents him from, I don't know, approving this or commanding that is because it's, it's a hidden appeal to God's moral nature. So I, I, otherwise, if he just is nature, what do you mean? Is being all-knowing? And all powerful. I don't get why those things would limit him. And so I think it's just a covert appeal, his nature, to meaning, pst, I mean, his moral nature. <laughs> and then, then you're back with the, the dilemma, you know, again. So I, I don't get that answer. Is that my, I think it's a, it's, it's not a legitimate answer because it doesn't work unless you um, assume that it's God's nature, his moral nature we're talking about. Gotcha. Well, we have been going for about an hour. It was a really great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. Do you want to give any links or references where people can find out more about your work? Um, yeah, so how can you find out more? I guess you. one way is you can just, I don't know, uh, Google Bruce Russell and see what he's written. I should have a better... Uh, uh, Vita available to people that I do, but uh, I don't know. I, I write in epistemology and ethics and mostly metaethics. Those are questions about, uh, I don't know, or moral, there are moral facts and how do you know them, stuff like that. And uh, the problem of evil and uh, I don't know, and really about, um, you can look in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I have an entry on a priori justification and knowledge. I talk about a lot of things about a priori justification because I think it's a central um, part of philosophy. I think uh, philosophy is mostly an a priori discipline. And so that's, you can get a, in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you can get a hint. There's a, I don't know, papers, I don't know, Google Bruce Russell and you'll see some of my papers. I'm working on a book for intro called Philosophy by Example, because I love using examples when I do philosophy. And it's called Philosophy by Example, um, an introduction to analytic philosophy. So let's hope in a year or so you'll be able to see that. Awesome. And we do have a few questions from the audience, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, Tim West asks, can you ask Bruce what important idea he changed his mind about during his career and what made him change his mind? I can think of a specific example. It's kind of a technical area in philosophy, but there are some people I do epistemology, like I said a moment ago, and there are some people who support something called pragmatic encroachment. By that, they mean that there are pragmatic reasons that can affect the standards of justification and knowledge. And example is, there's a famous simple little example about uh, Hannah uh, wants to bank her check on Friday. Uh, she has a very good reason because she's been there many times to her bank that'll be open on Saturday. She's thinking about going home and avoiding the, the lines and there's nothing really at stake. And so she has a, enough information from past behavior. Maybe she even reads the door, bank open uh, earlier days, bank open on Saturday. 
she uh, uh, then goes home and she seems justified. It, it, it seems she knows the bank's going to be open on Saturday, given all of her evidence. However, now imagine something's at stake, something really important. They've kidnapped her daughter. And if she, you know, doesn't have the money in the bank by Saturday, they're going to kill her daughter. And so now you think, oh, wait a minute, now she doesn't know that the bank is open on Saturday. And I used to think that that was true, that the standards for knowledge and the standards for justification go up as the stakes go up. I no longer think it's true. And um, I changed my mind about that. Um, that's one of the things. I kind of changed the way I do philosophy. When I was in graduate school, I started writing on a Kierkegaard and I had a lot of, uh, I don't know, courses in phenomenology and existentialism. And I came to Wayne State, it's a center of analytic philosophy. And I sort of learned how to do analytic philosophy at Wayne State. And so my kind of approach to philosophy changed radically when I came to Wayne State after, you know, a number of years and got sort of used to the way my colleagues were doing philosophy. So there's a little example of a specific one where I changed the view in epistemology. And this general change occurred when I went from graduate school to being a professor. Nice, perfect answer. Uh, Mr. Creening asks, if you have ever dealt with the problem of evil from an eternal ignorance model of sin, like in the Buddhist Hindu style of the problem of evil. I haven't. So <laughs> I'd like to hear, I don't know if the questioner can say more. Are you, is he just able to chat? I mean, they're, they're able to chat. I don't know if he could join the stream and ask or not. Yeah. I don't think that's possible, but he is debating it with uh, another um, person who's very oh. well versed church of entropy in the chat right oh. now. I always thought that, you know, Buddhism, but there are many strands of Buddhism that doesn't really accept, it doesn't believe there's a God, and so I don't know where the problem of evil comes in. Some people talk to me and think I am talking about a different problem than they are. Um, psychology friends of mine will sometimes be asking the question, why is there evil? And they want a psychological explanation of why people are evil. But that's not really the kind of classic problem of evil talked about in philosophy or religion. That's about, uh, you know, like I've been saying, how is the existence of an all-knowing, all-powerful, holy, good God compatible with all of the evil we see in the world? So I don't know whether there, that, that's an attempt to address this kind of psychological issue. Why are people evil? Buddhists have something to say about that. But I don't take it to be addressing the same thing I'm calling the problem of evil. Yeah, I think that's, he, he put a clarification, he says it's about how um, life becomes a quest of why I'm here in this world of suffering without a God to blame. Like, how do you, how do you attribute the fact that there is suffering without a God to blame? Oh, I think people are just, uh, um, probably for evolutionary reasons, selfish, not only selfish, but partly selfish, and their selfishness is a explains a lot of the evil they do. And then I think just natural disasters cause suffering. If you want to talk, if you consider that evil as in the problem of evil, it often is. It's kind of a problem of bad anyway, I think. But it just, uh, excuse me, as happens when it comes to natural evils, we're just little, little uh, I don't know, fleshy things. And when you have fires and earthquakes and disease, we suffer. The other kind of suffering, I think, is often caused because of, although people aren't solely uh, self-interested, they certainly are, and they cause evil in the pursuit of self-interest. Awesome. Well, I think that's it for the questions. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks.